Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Mistake Free Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, Mark Delator, and today I'm joined by only the second person to make a, a repeat appearance on the podcast, Andy Baber, Dr. Andy Baber. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be uh, to be repeat guest number two. Absolutely. Um, look, Andy and I uh, speak frequently as he is an SBD investor, and we were talking the other night about uh, the differences between uh, a long-term play and the short-term play. And it just, I, we were having such a deep and, and meaningful conversation that I thought, hey, you know what, we need to, to stick this, record it, and get it out to our other investors because there's just some absolute gems that came out of that discussion. So for all those out there that are thinking of investing in real estate, that have got some property, that are looking to scale and grow, um, Andy is someone who is, I would consider, a very sophisticated investor, understands the four tranches of real estate extremely well. Um, remember those tranches being lending and, and lending deals, syndication deals, uh, multifamily apartment complex syndications, uh, new construction and uh, turnkey real estate. So um, Andy is someone that I uh, trust uh, to give wisdom out to our investor base. And so I've asked him to come on today to talk a little bit about his commitment to building a portfolio and what he's found out along the way. Andy, for those out there that don't know you, when did you get started buying real estate and what was the uh, just a quick refresher on what made you kind of turn your corner and think that you needed to divest from the stock market and pursue this line of investing yeah it started back in maybe well i guess originally it started in like 2015 16 um where i had a few little misadventures uh with some local projects that i was just trying to just trying to dip my toe in the waters on some spec houses and some things that uh, didn't pan out like like I was hoping they would have, and that was mainly just due to my own lack of experience and knowledge, and just not knowing what I didn't know at that point. But I knew there was something to it, um, and I just had this notion that um, you know a non traditional path towards wealth building was going to be the most predictable thing. But it was going to take you know it's it's not it's not easy. The easy sort of effortless way is just to buy stocks and make your retirement contributions. And I mean, Wall Street has done such a great job of making that a, um, you know, just such an easy process that, um, you know, it makes sometimes real estate investing seem scarier than it should be. Um, but it does require some focus and dedication to learning. Uh, and but the the concept of building cash flowing real estate portfolio was just attractive to me in terms of creating some alternative sources of income in my life, and so that's where it started. And then, you know, I got involved in a group, uh, which is where we met a mastermind group that uh, really allowed me then to take my investing to the next level as far as my understanding, my learning, and my relationship building and networking, which is you know half the battle. So what we were talking about the other night was this <clears throat> this comparison between, the, and potentially a mis misconception, I believe, and what you and I are talking about is there's this myth out there that you can kind of, I mean, the, the ultimate goal for everybody is to retire with cash flow that will support your lifestyle and uh, you're free for life, so to speak. I think the misconception or the myth is that single family turnkeys leveraged at 80% can get you there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I you're exactly right. And, and my understanding of that has shifted because when I first started investing, that was really my plan it was like, okay, reverse engineer, how much are my living expenses? And then, you know, how many single family rental properties do I need to create a portfolio to offset that? And leverage you know, if you're, if your turnkey rental property produces $300 a month, um, it was going to take a lot of them, <laughs> like more than you might want to actually own. Mm. Um, and, and it was going to take a, a tremendously long period of time to build that up. And so, you know, I, I realized it became clear over the first few years of owning those homes that the cash flow that was coming off of them was not going to be that significant in terms of offsetting my income, my living expenses. But 
um, the leverage is such a crucial part of, of growing and making this whole thing work that my mindset sort of shifted on that and, and have really come in to understand the model as being just a slow, what we talk about crock pot method to, to wealth building. It's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to replace your income with turnkey rental uh, rents in a short period of time, but playing the long game, it's a tremendous tool for generational wealth building. 100% agree. And some may be kind of listening in thinking, oh my gosh, Mark, you sell turnkey assets and you're coming on here saying they don't generate enough cash flow to retire on. I want to be very, very clear. Um, they are an absolutely critical component of your wealth building model. The mistake people make is thinking that they are the instant uh, cash flow need to escape the rat race and to quit your job. Um, that is not the case. It is the what do they say? Uh, delayed gratification is a sign of maturity. I think it takes a mature investor to say, I'm going to forego now to succeed in the future. And that's something that I did, you know, seven to beginning 17, 18 years ago was start to build my portfolio. And we'll talk about re refinancing and how that can pay off in the future. But the staggering um, doubling and tripling of the appraised value or the after repair value of these assets is testament to, uh, you know, to validate exactly why you should be holding real assets. Um, but leverage has to be a part of that play, um, yeah. especially uh, when, when interest rates are just at historically low levels. Yeah, it's the, it's the secret sauce. I mean, it's, it's definitely like the tortoise and the hare story, you know, um, Turnkey rental properties is it's the tortoise, but it's it's the steady as she goes. Um, it's going to get you there. Uh, so unlike in, in, with a, with a predictability that I think is probably unrivaled in any other asset class. And in fairness, Andy, uh, a great hedge against inflation. I mean, everyone the hot button right now is inflation, and owning real assets um, is a great hedge against. I mean, when we're talking about the other. Uh, opportunities. Lending deals give you good income, but obviously that's typically taxed. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, syndication deals are great because you do have equity upside, but once that asset sells, then you got to go to redeploy the capital. The beauty right. of the turnkey asset is it's truly your asset that your LLC owns outright and you have full control over it and can own it indefinitely, uh, which is obviously the long play. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I don't think it's it's necessarily needs to be the only thing that an investor does, but I view it as a sort of stable foundation of mm -hmm. other uh, alternative investments. I do a lot of other investments uh, in lending, syndications, uh, and even in some other sectors, and mineral rights and that kind of stuff. But the foundation of my investment strategy is direct ownership of single family homes. Single family homes. Love it. Let's talk a little bit about um, the best use of funds. Um, let's say you have, um, you know, f you divest from the market and you've got, say, some self-directed IRA funds that you might have a million dollars in, in that account and you might have, you know, two or $300,000 in cash. Which would you put into uh, buying turnkeys and which would you choose to do syndicated deals with? What's your model? Yeah, so my model is not to use qualified money to own, to have direct ownership of, of rental properties. And there's some reasons for that, um, you know, and, and we can go over those. That it has to do partly with the fact that it's more difficult to take advantage of the advantages of leverage within qualified accounts. Um, yeah, you can't just get traditional uh 30 year fixed mortgages, you got to go out and find non recourse financing because you have to remember that, you know, Andy Baber is not the guy borrowing the money because my, that would be a disqualified um, transaction. I cannot help my IRA directly like that by lending my credit worthiness to it. So I have to go get non recourse financing. You can do it, it requires greater down payments. So you're not getting the mathematical advantage of the leverage. The lending terms probably aren't quite as favorable, 
Um, and then you're owning that rental property inside of your IRA, which just means that, uh, you know, if, if you were inclined, if you're the do it yourself kind of guy and you were inclined to, uh, you know, the something breaks and you were going to go over there and just fix it yourself. Well, you can't do that. That's a, that's a disqualified, you're a disqualified person to your IRA. Um, now I'm not the kind of guy that's inclined to do that anyways. That's why I have good management in place. But, um, you know, there's a lot of do it yourselfers out there that, uh, owning inside the IRA is, is probably not ideal for, especially if there's other investment options that you have. So, and you're not getting all the tax benefits. You know, one of the great reasons to own residential rental property is because it's a very tax beneficial, uh, asset class and, you don't get the tremendous tax benefits inside of your IRA because that is already a tax advantaged environment. So you can't take the same depreciation benefits that you would otherwise. So I just don't think it's a real efficient way to use your retirement funds. Um, and so I, I do other types of deals, syndication and lending deals within my retirement accounts that I self direct. And then I own my rental properties, you know, outright outside of any kind of qualifying. Smart. No, that marries up with uh, our philosophy here at the office as well. Love it. Um, let's talk about your results. <clears throat> You've obviously got a, a portfolio of properties. Um, how have you used uh, or have you seen your properties appreciate in value? And yes. um, have you been able to um, recapitalize or refinance and pull some cash out of those of those assets and give us give the audience a little bit of a um, an insight into what that has looked like over your um, four or five year period of owning these. Yeah. So uh, just actually this year did a cash out refinance on my properties in Kansas city. So how um, many do you own and how many did you uh, and how long had you owned them? Yeah, I have six properties uh, with SBD in, in Kansas, in the greater Kansas city area. Um, and I think I got into those, late 2017, 2017 and 18. and 18. Yeah, mostly may have been one or two that added in 19. Um, but mostly 17, 18. So when you went to the and, bank, you had about three year track record on these properties. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and I had initially gotten into, um, you know, I had them leveraged initially with some commercial financing, which, which was good. Um, but you know, the, uh, Fannie Freddie sort of institutional, uh, financing options just became even more favorable with the interest rates going down and, um, saw an opportunity as those, how I started looking on Zillow, which, you know, is, is, you got to take that with a grain of salt, but it was at least a bit of a benchmark for me to see like, okay, what did I pay for these things? This is what Zillow says they're worth. Like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting on you know, a sizable amount of equity in these houses already. And just understanding what I do about leverage and velocity, um, it, it became clear that it, it made a lot of sense to try to take some of that equity off the table, cash out. Um, when you do that through uh, refinance, it's not income, it's debt. So there's no tax consequence to that when you do that. And I was able to pull you know, north of six figures in cash out of those properties, the equity out of those properties to redeploy into other investments. And it just accelerates the wealth building process. So you, you uh, are- Your cash flow has stayed the same. That's awesome. So you are probably pretty close to pulling all of your cash out that you'd originally put in. It was more, it was more. <laughs> so I actually, you know, walked away from this refinancing process. And at the end of the day, I owned six rental houses in Kansas City that I didn't have to put any money into, you know, at this point. So I guess that's kind of an infinite return model because I, I, don't, I don't have any, I don't have any skin in the game, you know, compared to where I first started. And it was, it's, it's just at this point, it's just my credit worthiness uh, and ability to borrow on those assets that, is continuing to make this thing work. My cash flow stayed the same. Rents have gone up. Um, I, I switched from 20 years to 30 year fixed. Good interest rates. Payments stayed about the same as what I had them before and pulled a big chunk of money out to rinse and repeat. Well done. That's smart. 
It's an interesting note. I will. I remember when you and I first started working together and it was 2017, 2018. And uh, at that time, you know, we were now eight years from eight or nine years away from uh, this, the global financial crisis. And you were thinking, I don't know, man, are we at the peak of the market? Are we, um, you know, going back, can you remember how you were literally like, I don't know if these things will appreciate. We're kind of at the peak. Should I be buying? And the one mistake that I think people make is that they, and I'm going to steal your quote, you mentioned it earlier, but um, they will always overestimate what they can get done in one year, but underestimate what they can get done in five years. And to your point of the turtle and the hare, I think people always think, well, if I buy now, what if property goes down next year or if it if it market tweaks? If you had have had that mentality, you would not have the runs on the scoreboard that you do right now and these assets that are not only spitting off great cash flow, but also that you have zero money out for. Um, speak a little bit about that mentality and how that's changed as you've matured in an, as an investor, because I think rookie investors think too much short-sighted. And I think you have yep. grown in your maturity to know that it's the long game. It's totally the long game. And it's, it's funny we're talking about this because I just had a, a lengthy conversation with a close friend of mine last night over dinner. Um, he has an interest in getting involved. He's been seeing some of what I'm doing, some of the success I'm having, and wants to learn more about it. And, um, you know, I had to I had to correct him last night because he said, he said, man, uh, I mean, I'm just worried, like, what if these houses, you know, what if the market – collapses and, and these things take a dive and they're only worth, you know, half of what they were when I bought them. And I'm like, well, first off, that that probably is not going to happen to that level. But at the end of the day, the houses don't know how much they're worth. You know, it's not like your house is going to call you up and say, hey, I'm worth a lot less. You should be worried about this. Like, you know, the rents stay pretty steady in a down market. Um, worst case scenario, you have to drop your rents a little bit. But most of the time, the supply demand equation in a down market favors rents going up. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Hey, look, you're playing the long game here. If your houses go down in value over a three, it, which could have just as easily happened, Mark. I mean, when I bought those houses, uh, they could have, they could have stayed the same. They could have not appreciated them. If we'd had a correction, they could have gone down. I was fortunate that, you know, I got to, ride the wave of appreciation that's happened to my benefit. But honestly, I don't think it would have mattered because I still am in this for the long term. This is a buy and hold strategy. And the houses are going to appreciate over time. In a given two to three year window, that's really unpredictable. Over 20, 30 years of ownership, it's going to be really, really predictable. And the benefits of the appreciation are going to be there. So you have to be committed to the long game here and almost getting these things in place, letting them do what they do, keep your eye on them in the background as far as your manager reports and all that stuff. But I honestly don't think about them very often at all. They just, they're just in there doing what they do in the background. They're Raising just the turtle. value. They're just busy. going down. I get my check every month and. They're just the turtle. They're in the background just winning the, winning the, the winning the war, right? Yeah. Winning the war in the long run. Yeah, no, guys, summary here. Um, and Andy, I'll, I'll let you collect your thoughts and, and uh, kind of have a final word. But for highlights, I'd, I'd like to kind of take four key takeaways that I've made notes of. First of all, I love your quote that houses don't know what they're worth. I think I'm going to steal that one and use that again. That's a brilliant line. Um, rentals are a legacy play. Wealth building is done through assets. And assets such as single family rentals are extremely predictable and will double in value depending on what market you're in every 20 or 30 years. So when Andy talks about a micro market of two or three years or a micro term of two to three years, agreed. It could stay stagnant, could go up and down by five or 10%. But when we're buying cash flowing rental property in the markets of the Midwest that we do, extremely stable and uh, easily predictable. Secondly, Best used with leverage. Guys, leverage your assets. There's a lot of people out there that are um, paying all cash, which is fine, but you've got to leverage those assets um, to some degree to scale up with the short debt you have right now. When you're getting a you know, 7, 8 cap, 8% return on these assets, um, you know, 
when you're leveraging at 3%, you can almost double your uh, IRR on those assets in the short term to be able to scale and buy more. Third, utilizing the equity. Talk a little bit about dead equity, Andy. One of the comments that we have about, um, or the, uh, the challenges that we have uh, criticism per se about rentals is that you can have a lot of dead equity and um, cash tied up you have used utilized a refinance to pull that out you know the, the old saying that you've when you start with 80 percent leverage um and that consistently gets paid down over time not only from your tenant but also from the the value of the asset going up you were able to free up that capital um through an amortization that expanded and uh pulling out more cash at the time so talk a little bit about um accessing dead dead capital or i'll let you kind of take it if you have any thoughts on um the illiquidity per se that, that real estate gets a bag not for yeah yeah uh, i mean all those things are are correct uh the, the leverage i think is part of the magic that makes this work uh because uh you get to take advantage of that uh amortization over time and with a small amount of money, you can then control a larger value asset. So I can put 25 grand down and I can own a, an asset that's worth 100,000 um, using the bank's money. And my tenant pays that down or pays that off for me over time. Uh, now is my 25,000 tied up in that property? Yeah, it, it is somewhat illiquid uh, but there are strategies like a refinance that you can do, or once you own a bunch of these um, rental properties, you could potentially cross collateralize them and have a lot of credit against them. I mean, there are ways to access that um, equity if you need it. Uh, but, you know, the leverage is such an important aspect of mathematically how this works. Um, it also helps as an asset protection um, vehicle, you know, because if you've got your if you've got your homes leveraged, then somebody else is first in line. So that gives you a level of asset protection there against your slip and falls. I mean, all things you have insurance to cover. Sure. Uh, stuff that I don't I don't get too worried about, but um, there's that. And then we talk about inflation, inflation hedge. I mean, just owning the asset itself is an inflation hedge. Owning asset leveraged is even more of an inflation hedge because mm. now you borrowed those dollars to buy that house at today's value, um, but to the tune of five to seven percent a year at, in our current environment, maybe even more. Um, the dollars that you're repaying that that your tenant is repaying that loan with are worth less, um, and so the combination uh, inflation hedge of owning the asset and having it leveraged. Uh, is is very mathematically advantageous. Um, yeah, so the thing is, you, it's just, it's a, it's a long game. You gotta be in it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And um, what I've tried to, to coach my friends who are interested in this is to say that it, it, you, gotta, you gotta start taking action. You can't just think about it forever. You're gonna take that first step get that first house. You don't want to be the guy that owns one rental house. Mm. Okay. You got to have some diversification within your rental portfolio. And that means getting up to some critical mass where hey, if you have little problems along the way, which is an inevitable part of owning rental property, you're going to have a water heater go out from time to time. You're going to have to, you're going to have a tenant move out. There's going to be some downtime, a little vacancy. Those are all things that across a portfolio of rental homes are, blips on the radar screen that you barely even notice. Um, so there is some critical mass here that I think is important, but you got to start with the first one. And if you never take that action, then it'll never happen. I love that mentality. I also believe that it's slightly ironic that the same people that are saying um, that, you know, they, they don't want to take action because of what might happen with the real estate market, have their money in the stocks <laughs> with, with some yeah. sense of assurance that the same will not happen. I mean, goodness, are we not in a bit of a, you know, a proverbial bubble um, with, when it comes to the stock market? It's, it's so backwards, man. And it just goes to show you the, a level of uh, lack of understanding or knowledge about it. 
Um, one of my one of my partners recently uh, kind of offhandedly said he wasn't being mean about it, but we we were having a conversation. And he said, "Man, I I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if if I was investing the stuff you're in." <laughs> and I did I just kind of let it go because I'm like, well, there's it's not a whole lot of point in me trying to no. change his mind. It's like it's like when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. But you know, he has no idea that the level of volatility and exposure that his traditional portfolio has that mine doesn't. Yep. Uh, and, and so, Hey, at the end of the day, people got to have a place to, to live. They got to put food on the table and they got to have a place to live. And uh, we are in the business of providing safe and affordable uh, quality housing for people. And that's a need that's, that's never going away. So it's a very safe place to park your money. Well, Andy, you've matured into uh, a very seasoned and sophisticated investor, and, and you've done that through a commitment to training and, and educating yourself. So I commend you for that, and I appreciate our friendship and uh, and your commitment to the SBD model, um, supporting us through um, the different ways that you invest in, in housing. It's been a, a good partnership, I believe, in collaboration, and you've been been great at it. So thank you. Oh, man, thank you. I, I, I enjoy the heck out of our uh, relationship, both business and personal, and uh, Look forward to uh, marching on and continuing to see how this thing can grow. You bet. Thanks for your time. Guys, for all of you out there, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed um, some wise words from a very mature and sophisticated investor here in Dr. Andy Baber. Andy, thank you. Hey, thanks. You're listening to Mistake Free Real Estate Radio, the authority in passive real estate investing. No late night calls, no clogged drains, no tenant nightmares. Take the passive investor's approach to real estate investing and trust a turnkey professional. Learn more at mistakefreerealestate.com. Until next time, remember, you don't get rich from what you earn, you get rich from what you own.